Hi, grab your tea. I'm having matcha. It's cold now, but it, it is delicious. Um, so a while ago, I started, and like by a while, I mean like a full calendar year. I started planning this secret initiative with Social Income, which is an NGO based in Switzerland for Ebola survivors. And I recently got the question like, so how did you have, how did you get to that point? Like, weren't you a, a therapist? <laughs> And like, yeah, <laughs> true to my mystique and being on my mysterious African dad shit, I don't talk to you all a lot about my life or my circumstance. Um, so I would like to. I think that the exposition in order to understand how I got to this point is important. And it touches on a lot of the things that I uploaded in my last YouTube video. YouTube is very new to me. I've been on short form TikTok, Instagram land. Um, and while that's been really lovely and clarifying in some ways, I'm finding that there's only so much I can get in like a, a, a 30, 60, 90 second clip. So I'm looking to expand. I want to go wide and deep. So I'm here. Uh, you either stay a hero, you live long enough to see yourself become a video essayist. So right now, I mean, right now, as of June 11th, 2024, right? I'm organizing a universal basic income campaign for Ebola survivors in Sierra Leone. It's essentially publicly funded disability. Um, it's the first program of its kind in Sierra Leone, and I am ridiculously excited to be a part of this. In the last YouTube video I uploaded, I was talking about buying my tribe a uh, tractor, my father's tribe, the Limba tribe of Sierra Leone. And in the process, being equated with social income and starting this process of organizing with them. But the actual, like, the true exposition of this story starts way before that. It starts when I'm an undergraduate um, at Northwestern, when I went to Sierra Leone for my second summer of research and I was working with Ebola survivors to understand more of the narrative of disease that happened in Sierra Leone with Ebola. Ebola, like we heard about it all across the world, right? It was this huge, scary thing. It was an epidemic with a 50% fatality rate and the whole world was shaking in our boots, terrified that something like this could spread worldwide. So it was all eyes on this particular region of West Africa. There were three countries really deeply affected and Sierra Leone had some of the worst cases that were out there for the around 20,000, a little over 20,000 cases, 11,000 about were in Sierra Leone. It was terrible. It was absolutely awful. So I wanted to go there and understand what happened. I studied public health in my undergraduate career. I was a dual major. I studied public health and poetry. And I sat down with Ebola survivors and conducted interviews with them to help me understand what life was like before the outbreak, during the outbreak, and after the outbreak, whether there were post symptoms in their bodies, in their circumstance, what it was like moving socially, especially because my principal investigator at the time had said that Ebola survivor was a new identity. It was a new political identity. And I had no idea what that was at the time, right? At the time, this is 2019. I cannot imagine what it is like to live through a pandemic or to be under lockdown or quarantine. I can't imagine what it is like to be stigmatized for having gone through a pandemic and refusing to forget about it. Now, in a, a world where we've allowed COVID to become endemic in the Western world, I understand a lot more. But then when I was 20, this was 2019, I couldn't, I like the things that we were talking about, sorry, I'm outside. <laughs> the things that we were talking about felt um, not just foreign, it felt otherworldly. When I sat down with Ebola survivors, this was the most, this, it was easily some of the most radicalized I've been in a short amount of time. Um, I remember, I remember coming back to Sierra Leone still feeling like a stranger, like a foreigner in my own country. Both my parents are from Sierra Leone, but I grew up in the United States. I grew up uh, being raised in part by Black American people. You know, both my parents remarried. I have a lot of family um, that's traditionally Black American. I'm still descended of slaves on one side. So I didn't feel... Like, while I am, in terms of nationality, eligible for citizenship in Sierra Leone, it wasn't a place that I had gone. It wasn't a place that I was familiar with. And it was, I couldn't even, like, speak Creole properly. I mean, I still can't speak Creole properly. But even then, I was like, there were every kind of barrier that I could imagine was in place. I don't know what it's like to grow up in a rural environment in a disenfranchised country. Like that's 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 a life experience that's really really far from my upbringing in the United States, where we started in poverty and climbed our way up to a very shaky working class. But when I sat down in Kenema, which is uh, about a district and a half away from the capital city, so if Sierra Leone looks like this. It's like vaguely uh, vaguely circ circular. Freetown is just I'll have a map. <laughs> Put up a map. <laughs> 
Freetown is on the coast and then we're coming up line as in like out from the coast to the country to a place called Kenema. Um, Kenema is, uh, Kenema is still a city, but it's more rural than living in the capital city. That's for sure. And in terms of policy, the federal government of Sierra Leone tends to prioritize the safety, the security, and the infrastructure of those people that are living in the capital city over those people that are living in rural areas. And that tends to be the case like across the boards with nation states. We don't tend to give a fuck about what happens to rural people and certainly not indigenous people. And uh, the, the idea of indigeneity is something that still exists in Sierra Leone because lots of people are from everywhere. Uh, you have people, there are entire tribes made up of people that were formerly enslaved. That's my mother's tribe. Um, there are people that are indigenous to the region of Sierra Leone. That's my father's tribe, the one that I organized farm equipment for. And then we have a lot of people from everywhere else in West Africa because Sierra Leone is the first nation state of its kind, where it was created entirely as a, sla as a slave state, as a place to dump people that were formerly enslaved when they came to, uh, when when the empire that they were enslaved in came to the realization that slavery was no longer profitable and outlawed it. But it's not like they wanted those Black people to do well economically there. So they forced them out. They forcibly displaced them. This means ethnically there's a whole lot of people from different places. Um, and different people receive different kinds of, of treatment um, from, from the federal government. So up in Kenema, which is away from the capital city, um, and Kenema is a place where there are lots of Mende people, uh, some Timne people, but what they are not are people that take up a lot of the seats in in parliament in policy making they tend to be disenfranchised right so because of that disenfranchisement when ebola came to sierra leone it was moving from the outside in it was moving from the country in towards the capital city and the government's response was not really all that serious when it was affecting the people that were indigenous in, in indigenous tribes or in rural areas outside of the city the, the response from the government only really became serious when it hit Freetown. That's when everybody started to panic about Ebola for real. That's when there were lockdowns. That's when there were quarantines. That's when the military was deployed to make sure people weren't leaving their houses. That's when lots of policy began around containing the disease. But while it was moving through rural parts and people were dying in mass, I'm talking like entire family lines, bloodlines, villages, erased off the map, the government was still saying that, you know, it's not that serious, we have a handle on it, when that was very, very, very much not the case. And that cost people their lives, both their, their lives as in their physical life, they died or they succumbed to the disease. Um, Ebola is estimated to be around 50% fatality, but in some places where there was absolutely no care available, the fatality rate was a 90%. It, it felt like a death sentence. That did a couple things. It made sure that the disease narrative of Ebola was, it's a death sentence if you get it, there's no cure. Um, and it also meant that one of the first hotspots of Ebola after Kailan was Kenema. Kenema becomes this epicenter of care that people are taken to um, if they contract Ebola at a really early phase. That's scary, you know? We can't, uh, it, it's really difficult to imagine sending your family member to a hospital that's many, many, many miles away from you and never seeing them again. So it caused a lot of distrust in the government. Um, and just generally, the response to getting people together was really was was abhorrently slow it was a negligence that cost people their lives again not just in death but also in the the stigma that these people experience that i'll talk about in a little bit so i'm sitting down in kenema i've never been here before i am not from the tribes that are that are common up here There's, those are Mende people those are Timne people um and i'm already mixed tribally which is uncommon again i'm ethnically mixed by a lot <laughs> um but there's language barriers. Nobody speaks English, right? Um, my I would not say that my native language is English, but my strongest language is English by now for sure. So I speak Creole with an English accent. I also speak Creole with like a slightly British accent because of uh, my mother being from the Creole tribe. And these people speak Creole as their second language. Their first language is their tribal language. There's language barriers. Um, there's class barriers, right? I'm coming from an elite. Uh, I'm coming from an elite us-based institution on their dollars and they are living rural lives in abject poverty in sierra leone many of them are even barred from getting work because of the stigma that's on ebola survivors there's age barriers i'm, I'm significantly younger than most of the people that i interview so this is a recipe set up for disaster right i'm an outsider coming in the only commonality that we share is uh my nationality because i was able to get my sierra leonean citizenship but these people have no reason to trust me 
And further than that, I'm a researcher. Ebola survivors have been subject to a lot of research that never comes back to them and never benefits them. It's a pretty parasitic relationship that many disenfranchised people or many people that go through a particular kind of tragedy have with the academy. There's this, um, a desire to pry people open and see their most intimate, vulnerable stories. And then nothing comes of that for you. The researcher that does it or the author that does it gets accolades and awards if it's written well. If they write it under an academic institution, at the time I was at Northwestern, Northwestern might get held or lauded or more money. And then the people that that story is actually about get nothing. They get nothing. They go through the work of being vulnerable and being open and talking about what are some of the most difficult experiences of their lives for no material gains. There's not, attention is not a zero sum game. I've talked before about the experience of being Sierra Leonean and knowing distinctly how the right kind of aid and the right kind of help hinges upon the right kind of people seeing you. But Sierra Leone is not a country that people have objectively not heard of. If you've heard of it, it's usually for something that's really, really traumatic, such as the Civil War or Blood Diamonds or Ebola. It's never for, you know, our beautiful greenery or our gorgeous mountains or our technological advancements in, in green climate change solutions. Like it's always, it's always for the worst stuff. So attention is not always something that helps us out. And I'm unique, like I'm, I'm, I'm desperately aware of this, right? I'm sitting here trying to get research done because I want to go to medical school and medical school in the United States requires that you do research in your undergraduate career. And I can't shake this feeling that I am set up well to be a parasite to these people that I otherwise want to love. And like everything is stacked against me. So I'm not expecting this to be, I don't know, all, all I'm coming in with is the idea that I don't want to do any harm, but I'm not expecting to be beneficial, if that makes sense. I'm not expecting this for this to be intimate. And I was so wrong. I was so wrong about that. What ended up happening um, was that these people became my first tribe. Like before I felt comfortable in my first tribal language crew, before I even knew that I was Limba, because at that time I had no idea, or I think I had found out like two weeks prior. These people took me in, embraced me. We shared bread. We had water. We sat for hours and talked about the experience of what it was like to be infected with disease before anybody cared. Now, I did also interview Ebola survivors in Freetown um, because Ebola survivors have organized themselves into a nonprofit that has chapters across the country. They realized that if they were going to get any sort of sustained help, medical attention, aid, anything that was going to help them live livable lives, they were going to have to band together to do it. In fact, th there's a really good book about this. It's called... Um, how a people science ended an epidemic by Paul Richards, which talks about the crucial role that Ebola survivors took in actually ending the epidemic of Ebola in Sierra Leone instead of letting it become endemic like the Western world would was happy to let happen. Western world is only good for body bags. Uh, ask the Diné people how they handle COVID. After organizing during the Ebola epidemic to make sure that people knew that it is not a lost cause, that you can survive Ebola, that the narrative of there is no cure, don't go for treatment, is not helpful. In fact, early treatment can be the difference between life and death. That drip IVs and rehydration is really crucial to surviving the symptoms of Ebola, that Ebola is very survivable, and that you shouldn't be afraid to go get treatment because people were thinking that the hospitals were abducting and killing people. It was that bad. If they had not gone door to door and sensitized their community, it would not, like, nobody would have been courageous enough to actually protect themselves from the course of disease. Because the idea was, if you got it, you're as good as dead, so like, why even try? I mean, like, I can't imagine that our hearts or our heads are far from that, given how we've let COVID come endemic in the United States. But again, I digress. That is for an entirely separate video. If they had not organized themselves to make sure that they could advocate for not only their best good because they'd already gotten Ebola by then. They were already stigmatized by them. They were being cast out from their communities. They took it upon themselves to make sure that they ended a disease they were already suffering from. And then they organized to make sure that they could continue to receive benefits after that. Like it was, it was humbling. It was beyond humbling to be able to sit with them. And particularly those in Kenema that were contract that contracted the disease before anybody cared before anybody wanted to care, before anybody even wanted to acknowledge that Ebola had come in the country in the first place, um, them and their families were dying. It wasn't until 
I remember sitting with someone um, that was interview eight. Her interview name is Micah. They all have pseudonyms to make sure that I uh, maintain their maintain their anonymity. Her interview name was Micah. She was 18 on the day that we sat down for that interview. And I swear to you, like, I, I wrote about this um, in my book, Drugs of Denial, which is about how Ebola survivors radicalized me and helped me begin to piece together just how genocidal this world actually is. But there was this turning point for me interviewing her because she was telling me about what it was like to lose her entire family to Ebola. Like I said, this, this thing was a killer, particularly in areas where there was no treatment, where there were no treatment wards, where there was no protocol, there was no nothing. She had a family of like seven or eight, and they all got Ebola. Her, her siblings, her parents, they all went to a treatment center together, and then she came out. She was the only one. She and her little brother, they were the only ones that survived. She lost her whole family. And I had to stop the interview because she was crying, and I, like, I had to let her cry. I had to sit with that with her and then you know I asked her if she wanted to continue she said she did so we continued and then I started crying because she was so young she looked like she had her hair like braided up in cornrows and she had all these barrettes like if you if you were in black America you know exactly what I'm talking about all like the the bedazzled bangles the the cowrie shells the um the bobbles like she had like 20 in her hair so you mean to tell me you're still young enough to wear barrettes in your hair like this and you've lost your entire family what do you how do you just continue and I started crying because I was sitting there watching her cry going like I'm also really young I'm only 20 these people keep looking at me like I'm a child and I am I don't know how to sit with this. I don't know how to hold on to this with you. I'm touching your grief with my bare hands. Nobody taught me how to protect myself from this. And in general, anthropology and ethnography, what I was trained with, those are really white fields. The idea is that you're studying a populace that's really, really different from you. But I'm sitting here with a populace that has adopted me sooner than my mother's tribe did. Thinking like, you look, you look just like me. And the only reason that this happened to you and not to me in this way is because of the circumstances of my birth, because I was born in the United States, because my family fled the war, because my family had the uh, had the capital to flee the war. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking about so many things, like there are so many ways that you can die systemically, and there are so many different kinds of warfare, that it didn't have to be like this. That if the government that we had, if we had a federal government that had decided to care a lot sooner, that had decided that nobody is expendable or disposable, you wouldn't have lost your entire family. That there's not actually any distance between you and I, that all my all my academic research had prepared me to, to be mindful of the gap, to be mindful of the distance between researcher and participant. And I'm sitting there like there's no distance. She looks just like me. Is that what I look like when I cry? Is this what I would sound like? We're so close that it might as well be me. She looks just like me. I had no idea what this was going to feel like. I'm walking in thinking that I'm going to be a parasitic outsider. And these people sat with me, some of the most difficult circumstances of their life. And when I asked them if there was anything that they wanted me to know, or that they are any any parting words at the end of every interview. Nine times out of ten, they said, "Don't forget about us." Like you, you're our sister. You're the only one of all the researchers that have come through here and poked and prodded at us. You're the only one that's Sierra Leonean. You're the only one that suffers through, you know, your terrible crew just to talk to us in a language that we're comfortable with and we understand. When you go back to the United States, do not. Forget about us. Don't go back to your institution and get comfortable again. Remember us here and find a way to do something for us because nobody cares. That's a big task, right? I'm 20. I don't have, at least I feel, I feel very powerless. I feel very disenfranchised. I feel, I feel like a kid. I am a kid. 
I've just finished, you know, my, my, my junior year of college. I have no idea what to do. But I, I sure as hell don't forget about them. How can I? I'm saying, like, I, the next few months of my life were hellish. Like, I, I went from seeing people in abject poverty, seeing people suffering under such intense stigma that their community members don't even want to touch them. That some of them got cast out from their families. Some of them have been evicted from their homes. I'm seeing the aftermath of a war zone. And then I just like go back to college <laughs> and try to live a normal life. Like nothing is normal after that. What do you return to? What do I stake my beliefs around? Yeah, I went for, I, I really, I went to Sierra Leone um, to do research because I needed to make sure that I had research re credits for applying to medical school because I wanted my very rich institution to pay my way home because before that I hadn't been able to afford to go home. <laughs> And because I was studying public health and, and Ebola was on everybody's minds, right? I went to college, my first year of college was 2016. And the Ebola epidemic officially was declared like over, over in 2016. So it's fresh on everyone's minds. It's the, it's the teaching example. I am yet again living a life where some of my country's most traumatic moments are teaching examples for my Western peers. I don't know what to do. I'm not okay. Everyone can tell I'm not okay. I'm falling apart at the seams. I'm crying everywhere. I can't sleep. I see these people everywhere, everywhere, out the corner of my eye. I see them looking back at me when I'm brushing my teeth. I see them when I'm lying in bed, not sleeping. I see them everywhere, everywhere. And I don't know what to do. I'm trying to write academic papers and do my coding and go about this the, the normal way that you're supposed to. And I can't. I'm not all right. I don't want to take uh, Tony Kate Bambara in this book called Conversations with Tony Cade Bambara, which is edited by the lovely Sabiti Lewis. Um, Tony Cade Bambara talks about the concept of being an emotional gangster, how she doesn't want to just like pluck people from their real life circumstances and paste them on a page for people to read. And I feel that way about a lot of ethnography and anthropology. I think I owe these people their privacy. I don't, I don't, I was trying to talk about what I experienced without just laying out their trauma spread eagle on a page somewhere so that Westerners could come read it and feel sad and think about what we can learn from these poor African people that keep dying. I didn't want that. I thought that was not just irresponsible. I thought it was cruel. So, I mean, this is a book I've, I've talked a lot about, um, conversations with Tony Cade Bambara. I've done a whole bunch of work with it. It's one that I would recommend, but I didn't have that language at the time, but I think that's exactly how I felt. The, the next couple of years were just me surviving like the dissolution of my mind and witnessing this and trying to, trying to move forward. I wanted to protect their dignity. Yeah. I wanted to protect the sense of privacy that I feel like they should have. The farther away that we are from tragedy, the more up close we want to be. I had a, a an English professor that talked about this. And it was surreal during 9-11 watching press across the world. Because in the United States, when people talked about 9-11 and when people reported on it, the picture would just be of the still standing Twin Towers. Like there was, that it would be like this beautiful classy shot of the Twin Towers that now didn't exist anymore. But when he, and this was like, you know, this was in the early 2000s, 2001. Um, so search engines are just becoming a thing. The World Wide Web is just becoming a thing. So when my professor used the internet to search for what other countries were saying, like he's found Japanese press that had like pictures of like mangled bodies and people that jumped out of, of the building. The farther you away, the farther away you are of the tragedy, the more gory it gets. Like the, the closer that you want to get to like how sticky and gritty and messy the death and grief is and i did not want that not all attention is good attention and attention costs you something it, it costs you something to have eyes on you i wanted to tell usable truths that's another thing that tony k bambara talks about usable truths i wanted to tell truths that were beneficial to the people that participated and and gave themselves a part of me i wanted to have i wanted to keep them in safekeeping yeah i don't want to sell out like a part of my people you know so many years passed <laughs> um in the in the previous youtube video um which i'm buying my tribe attractor 
I talk a lot about how I'm dealing with what it feels like to come out of passive suicidality. And I will say that this experience definitely contributed to that. A, a, a profound sense of helplessness followed me, especially in my early 20s, because I had this big, bleeding, broken heart about the world. And I did not feel like I had the agency to act on it or change anything around me materially. And that was maddening. It actually, like, it physically drove me insane. It drove me to drinking. Um, it, it drove me to various kinds of drugs. I, I was working in a circumstance. I was a, a stripper in, in grad school to survive the economic toll of grad school, I would say. Uh, so there were lots of substances available to me all the time. And it got harder and harder to say no because it was just so difficult to go about life understanding now how much how many ways a nation state can formulaically kill people in mass? How many ways a nation state can weaponize negligence to make sure that they don't have to lift a finger when the right people die? How much in this day and age, we have so much access to making sure preventable care is accessible and making sure that uh, peri care, care, care that is designed to deal with acute, acute symptoms like an epidemic is available and how instead the care that we got from 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 westerners were people in spacesuits taking care of dead bodies people were denied their burial rights they were buried in shallow mass graves far away from their family you know what it's like to be denied your burial rights in a country like sierra leone that's so mixed ethnically where we have a slight muslim majority where bodies need to be taken care of in three days maximum what it was like to not be able to touch your own dead. What it was like to have to wait for a Westerner in a space that you can't even see their face to come and abduct your, your, your family member from your home and you don't even know where they're buried. Those are human rights violations. Easily. Obviously. It was terrible. Witnessing these things, hearing about these things up close, it drove me insane. It, like, it literally drove me to drinking because I felt so powerless to change it. It was not until, okay, so, you know, now we're, I said I was going to go to medical school after undergrad. I did not. Sitting with these people and hearing, especially the state of their mental, like the, the, the state of uh, the circumstance of what it was like to be cast out from their communities. It wasn't just, uh, the, the post effects of Ebola were not just physical in their body, right? Because a lot of them have joint pain, chronic fatigue. It messed with their reproductive systems. It messed with their eyes. If it, if it wasn't the Ebola, it was the chlorine. It wasn't just the physical symptoms. It was also the mental weight, the mental difficulties of being outcast in their own communities, of being outcast in communities that they were once joyously a part of. And there was no, there was no care for that. We don't have good or really functioning at all mental health care infrastructure in Sierra Leone. And I saw that that was like a desperate need. We had all these doctors that were prescribing medicines that they didn't have access to. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to be a doctor that's worth my salt, I need to understand systems really well so that I'm not going, okay, well, you need Tylenol for your fever, not understanding that Tylenol is not easy to get as someone who is chronically underemployed in a rural area in Sierra Leone. And I also need to make sure that I'm able to deal with people's mental scape because people are not walking symptoms, right? People are um, a, a, a network in and of themselves. They have communities, families, relationships with themselves and their own bodies, relationship with their government or their their regional tribe, tribal system. People have all these things that collect them to make a life. And I need to be cognizant of the ways that their outside circumstance, the ways that their micro, meso and macro systems combine to create their circumstance. All of that is relevant to care. Medical school don't care about you becoming a social worker. So as far as medical concerned, medical school is concerned, this degree is superfluous. But I did not find it superfluous. And this was the first time that I had ever been radicalized to the point where I was willing to pivot from, from what otherwise made sense. That begins my process of radicalization there and then. Not when I had the idea that this was wrong, but when I was willing to change my life quite drastically, honestly, to take on a lot of debt, to spend a lot of time on something that felt superfluous to my otherwise goals because... I was affected to the point where I felt like I needed to. So I'm in graduate school. I go to graduate school for clinical social work with a concentration in health administration and policy. Remember my first degrees were in global health and in poetry. Instead of writing a nice, beautiful academic paper write up, I wrote poetry because I felt like it did a, I think that poetry does a very good job at getting up close to a thing um, without giving the thing away. 
at getting people up close to what it felt like to be there with them so that you can see them through my eyes without being an emotional gangster in that way. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this poetry that I'm sure nobody cares about, but I, I work really hard to write it anyways, and I'm really proud of it. I go to graduate school. Again, I become a stripper to survive the economic toll of graduate school. I learn firsthand what it feels like to experience stigma like that. I begin to understand what they mean when they say people don't want to touch my body. People don't want to come near me because being in sex work in the United States, uh, especially sex work in a, 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 a very traditional <laughs> West African family, was not for the faint of heart. <laughs> But all of that helps to inform my experience and all of that helps further set me on the course of radicalization. I'm willing to change my actions fundamentally. I'm willing to pivot. I'm willing to move away from what I otherwise think is sane to get done what I feel like needs to get done in this world. And I'm willing to acknowledge the ways that I have power because sinking into powerlessness and desperation is honestly the coward's way out. You can't have these things happen to you and not let it change you. And if you let it change you, that means you have to do something different. And for a while, it's not going to make any sense. I call that period of my life the great dissolution because it felt like my brain melted into mush. I felt like I dissolved. Everything about my life came crashing down and I had to build it back up again. So, uh, and including in that crashing down was housing insecurity. I lost my apartment. Uh, I was more or less couch surfing and living out of my car. I drove across the country. Um, I crashed in with my parents who were also housing insecure. It was bad news bears, okay? Like, I am like, I'm literally ruining my own life based on what I think is right. But it makes me more and more aware of the parts of the world that we are designed to look away from, that we're designed to not see. I have watched genocides fall out of the news cycle, not because they stopped, but because the news did not want us to pay attention to that part of life anymore. I mean, we watched it happen with Black Lives Matter. The way the policing is set up in the United States is absolutely, absolutely is, is a, a slow twitch of genocide. It's one that's designed to keep us in constant fear and subordination and subjugation all the time. And we watch that fall out of the news cycle. Have police killings stopped? No. This year, it's June. They've killed over 100 people nationwide. It's June. It hasn't stopped. Uh, it's just a genocide that fell out of the news cycle. I watched the Sierra Leoneans of a war fall out of the news cycle far before it ended. Not because it stopped, but because the news did not want us to care anymore because we had had our fill of Africans that are dying as per usual. They reinforce, they used us to reinforce the status quo and they moved on. I watched COVID, a genocide by negligence, weaponized negligence, fall out of the news cycle at 100,000 deaths that was an unthinkable loss. When we had started out of this pandemic, a million losses, lives lost was unthinkable now we are far past that we never talk about it right so during that time i watched monkeypox have an exponential rise in chicago i'm a sex worker i'm vulnerable to monkeypox i'm watching people not care because it's it's affecting sex workers and gay people or people that are queer otherwise deviant from the beautiful arc of heterosexuality um, i start making noise about it i'm like deemed crazy at my workplace by my social work friends, because I'm treating this like an emergency where the state does not want to treat it like an emergency. They declared a state of emergency with no emergency plan. Was asked, I lost my mind. Everybody's looking at me and talking about me like I'm nuts. I'm like, maybe I am fucking nuts, but I can't. I cannot unsee this because we are so fucked. <laughs> if another disease comes while we are all weakened, while our healthcare system is weakened and constantly overwhelmed and teetering at the brink of collapse, if this, is, if this is where we are and this is what we, we, we decide that we want to do, then the moment that another disease comes concurrently, we are fucked. I'm in fact watching bird flu happening right now. A bitch is very nervous. But because I am doing all this dying off screen, I decide to pick up a camera. I start running my mouth, professional yapper. I mean, I actually am a professional yapper because I did go to school for therapy. So like quite literally am a professional yapper. But I start talking on TikTok. I don't know, just telling stories at first. And then I started talking about the things that I'm seeing. I remember Roe v. Wade getting overturned and there being a lot of panic, but not being out of sources. And I'm like, okay, well, let me tell you about when I've seen this in history before. Let's talk about it. We have blueprints for how to survive when the state systematically rolls back your reproductive rights or starts restricting movement. Like these are, these are emergencies. They aren't emergencies that are going to explode right away. These are emergencies that are going to get worse over time. But that means that we have to make sure that our organizing is as protracted as theirs. As my auntie Dequia always says, struggle is protracted. We have, we have blueprints for this, right? 
And then people found it helpful. And I like being helpful. And I, I mean, I, I told myself that I wasn't going to run my mouth about politics online. Now look at me. <laughs> but I liked being helpful. And I, I thought it was a gap in what I saw on, on TikTok. So I started there. And then from there, I realized that maybe I'm in the position to do some good because it's not a lot of Sierra Leoneans on the world stage. In fact, it's very few. I don't actually know of any Sierra Leoneans that are that are really truly in the public eye other than Idris Elba, who I think is half Sierra Leonean, half something else. But it's like uh, it's a, it's a small country that nobody cares about until it's time to extract our resources or look at the ways that we keep dying. And I didn't want that. I wanted to make sure that I could do good and expansive things. So um, a year in, I was working with my dad. He asked me um, to get help buying farm equipment and I crowdsourced all of that money and that set my life on a very different course again I already have a full video explaining that but that's when social income found me so I wanted to explain this because somebody asked me you know how did you get to a point where you could organize with them uh through a lot of believing that something like this was possible in the first place from having my life changed fundamentally from having Ebola survivors touch me and leave a mark when I was 20, to waiting and waiting and hoping and praying and actively thinking for the opportunity to benefit them. That didn't come until I was 24, but I, I had very specific ideas about what I wanted and I didn't let it go. I would, write, I would write it down, I would meditate on it, and then I would look for ways to continue to change my life such that something like this, something like an opportunity like this would be hospitable to me. So when I got online, and then when I decided to use my online platform for uh, collective and social good, rather than using it for selling spin brushes or I don't fucking know, crochet pieces from Sheen or whatever the fuck, rather than um, involving myself in being a walking mall by constantly taking sponsorships to mine my audience for money, I said, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking any sponsorships. I'm going to completely focus on what I can do to improve the world around me. I don't labor under the impression that I can save the world. But I do think that I can have, have a hand in saving my world. I don't labor under the impression that I can save the world. But I do think that I can have an active hand in saving my world and saving my own world. I just refuse to believe that goodness is impossible. And in that video, when I'm talking about buying farm equipment for my tribe, I'm talking about coming out of passive suicidality because it felt like hope was superfluous or like silly it felt silly to have hope in the world because things were so awful and things didn't feel like they were going to get any better and it really wasn't until i started believing like no things can get better i don't have to sit down and take this and the things that i care about i think that other people can care about them if i can manage to tell them how and to show them how daring to believe that i was right led me to believing that more was possible you know what i'm saying So social income found me because I decided to make a fool of myself on TikTok <laughs> and Instagram. At that point in time, I had expanded a little bit um, running my fundraiser. They said, we actually already work uh, in Sierra Leone. We're a non-governmental organization, meaning that they're not under the government of Switzerland. These are Swiss people that have organized to do something good. And they work in universal basic income. Right now, their programs are really small because they're entirely volunteer organization. They don't take any money from the donations that they collect. They have a one-to-one -one policy as in if they get a dollar or a euro or a Swiss franc or whatever, um, a Sierra Leonean gets the equivalent of that on their mobile phone. Like that's the coolest thing that I've ever heard. And in fact, it's actually radicalized me in thinking like, how do I implement zero, zero fee policies in my own work? I've been, I've been thinking on that and there may or may not be more on that later. But I sat down with them or at least two members uh, Cabello, who's one of the presidents, and Ricardo, who's um, on communications, to talk about this project and what it means and why they choose to do the work that they do for free. And just like talking about the revolutionary optimism that I wish that more of us had, because a lot is possible. We just have to start believing it's possible and then we have to start moving like it is possible. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Anyways, here's the interview. Thank you so much for, for sitting through this long-ass exposition with me. And I will see you in the next one. It's kind of weird to be like, 
I don't know, vlogging activism. But I do think that showing my work is important. And the more people that ask me to show my work, the more I'll do it. So, like, word. <laughs> okay, have a good day. Enjoy the rest. I grab your tea. I'm having chai with matcha in the same cup. Two things different in Europe. I'm on a field trip. I'm here with social income, or at least two members. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Cabello Morocani Rufo, and I am the co chairperson of the board um, on social income. And I'm glad to be doing this with you. Hello, I'm Riccardo Tamburini, and I help with communication at Social Income. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a question and answer. First, what is what's social income? Social income is a non profit that is established in Switzerland, and we provide universal basic income for people living in poverty. Currently, we are in Sierra Leone. Second question, where are we right now? Now we're in Barcelona because I am the only social income member who lives here and I thought it was a very nice idea to invite everybody here to do this video and introduce you to the magical world of um, NGOs. NGOs. One of the reasons I wanted to introduce you all to social income is because they do things a little differently. They're a volunteer-based organization, right? Like, none of these people get paid to do this work. They all have separate full-time jobs. So what, what drew you to the work? What drew you to take like a whole other separate thing <laughs> to make sure that you could provide, I don't know, some basic care for people that you might never see or meet? So I think for me, I always thought of like my grandmother and how she raised us. We always, she always had enough for just one more person. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she served her community really well. She worked really hard at the church. And I think what was really instilled is help, help, help. You know, what can you do to help? And when I met Sandino and um, he was already forming the organization and he wanted people who possessed certain skills. I studied law, I did a business degree as well and initially we were also trying to um, register social income as a non-profit in Switzerland and I knew that there were skills that I could offer but I think what I didn't really anticipate is how fulfilling it would be for me to do this work. I think I go to work and I work 100% in banking but really, I get so much joy from doing this work that is more fulfilling than really the salary that I get from my 100% job. So this is why I do it and this is why I'll continue doing it. That was really lovely. Oh, we're still rolling. I'm going to just hand this to you. <laughs> well, I, I started in Social Inco because I wanted to do something. It's like I've always been thinking, uh, what can I do to change the world? And there was one day when I said, well, start to do something. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I joined uh, the, the organization and I started helping with communication. And I feel like my dream is like that everybody can have the same uh, chance in life. And um, I feel like we have the power to at least do something, even if it's little that can really be big for someone else. We, we sometimes we just don't realize that uh, it, it doesn't take like this kind of massive efforts. You can just really contribute to improve someone else's life with, with little, a little thing. The question I ask all the time, especially when we like think about lives and we do like community think sessions is, what does it look like to win? Like what, what, do, you, what do you dream of? What does freedom actually look like? I think for me people shouldn't have to, like no one should have to struggle for the basic things. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Sierra Leone is uh, food secure, so a lot of people only have one meal a day. Mm. That's like the majority of people have one meal a day. And I mean really, just like let's just take a moment and think about that. You know, if you woke up and you had to, kind of the little that you had, you had to make sure that that sustains you through the whole day. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't, I don't understand why the world still works like that, especially if Sierra Leone is one of the richest countries on the planet. Why is it that <laughs> if we have all the mineral resources and the agriculture and, I mean, fisheries, we are on the coast, why is it that people are still food secure and really they don't have the basic needs? And you're saying this is a South African. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, I mean, I... It's the same struggle in different fonts. Yes. <laughs> so for me, I think let's enable everybody to have like just the basic needs that they have. Let's them have them. Yeah. yeah. What does winning look like for you? Sorry. Winning. What does it look like to win? To win. I mean, win. Uh, it means like I don't know, being happy, enjoy life, mm. with all the beautiful things. Mm. I mean, you don't need to have this enormous amount of no money or success or be popular, just need 
to have good people around you and mm. help each other yeah. and like what was Cabello was saying like we, I feel like we yeah, as a world we have the resources mm -hmm. to, to allow anybody to be to have that yeah. to have the basic really things that helps you have a, a, a dignified life yeah. and food and uh, we have nature nature is for everybody it's for free yeah. I mean and Sierra Leone is such a beautiful country, so it's really. I feel like it's like when you when you watch like a, a plant growing, wow. right? You, I would like that uh, it could be the same with humans. Just uh, contribute to the development of that plant of that community mm -hmm. in a way that it grows and it blows and it has a beautiful flower. Yeah. And I mean, that's my idea a bit of why I'm doing this. Yeah. That was like something. Not, <laughs> this man was nervous about being on camera. <laughs> say that again. What did you say? Trees, are, trees the, are the best teachers. How do you mean? They're very rooted, very stable, and they provide so much sustenance, shelter, you know, shade. I mean, really, they give us so much. Wood, yeah. we, you know, we can facilitate life. That's something I think about in Sierra Leone all the time because um, our trees are like the jewels of Sierra Leone, in my opinion. I know we have actual jewels, right? Diamonds and gold and all that stuff, but mm -hmm. you can't eat diamonds. Yeah. You can't eat gold. We love them because we assign value to shiny rocks. Yes. But the trees, they, they keep our the, t the soil of the mountains in place. Absolutely. I mean, they do a lot. Like, they've been there for hundreds of thousands of years, yep. you know? So um, when we uproot the trees, there's mudslides that happen. That actually happened a couple years ago, and it's pretty devastating. Yep. Yeah, because of the constant deforestation. Mm -hmm. So when I think about caring for elders, and elder care is like a, becoming a huge part of my practice for care infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I think about caring for elders, I often think about caring for trees, yep. that are elders. Tell me about social incomes model. Um, so we give um, unconditional 100% donations. We leverage mobile technology um, to get this money from people to other people. So human to human uh, transfer. There's a big important part here, no overhead. Yes. That's why these people are volunteers, so Absolutely. that they don't have to take any fees. Yep, the money that we get from contributions goes completely as it is to the recipients that we have. Mm. And this allows to to give the recipients full control of the money. Absolutely. Uh, this is super important for us because um, we don't want to patronize. Uh, everybody knows better uh, what's good for them at the moment. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you donate um, soap when you need food, for right. example. Yeah. So people know what they need Absolutely. and how to use their money. We, we are built on trust, so we trust the recipients that they are know better than us Absolutely. how they're going to do their money. Which they do. And I think the problem with foreign aid for a long time is that there is this infantilizing of people who live in poverty that uh, you know, the, the providers of the aid know better. Mm. But actually, people living in poverty are really resourceful. They've had to do so little with nothing that uh, literally people in poverty can do a lot of things out of nothing, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, because they, they've had to. They've had to survive, had to feed their kids and everything. So I, I really agree with uh, what, what Ricardo is saying, that the idea is um, cash is intersectional. Mm. So it can resolve immediate needs. So if someone is sick, they can go to the doctor. If someone needs food, they can feed, you know, they can eat. If a child needs a uniform, mom or dad can buy a uniform for their kid. And I think that's the, the intersectionality of cash and the fact that in Sierra Leone there's more mobile phones than people. So mm. you know, let's let's get the money into into people's hands. Yes. Okay, so to set the scene, like a year ago, so, I am so. checking my Instagram DMs, which never happens. Don't DM me. I'll never see it. But at that point in time, I was like, let me just see what's in here. Because there was like 100 messages or something like that. And I saw a message from someone called Karen, who said they work for social income, um, had asked me during my fundraiser for like farm equipment for my tribe if we'd be interested in a universal basic income program. And I said, you know, my tribe is, Limba Nation is very large. It's like 45,000 people. Maybe we could start a bit smaller. Um, I've been working with the uh, Boulder survivors of Sierra Leone slaves uh, for quite some time now and I think that they could really benefit from something like this so then we started it was a lot of like figuring out how the scope were deviating from your normal model right exactly yeah basically our model currently is like we establish partnership with a local organization in Sierra Leone and uh, they provide us with a list of uh, vulnerable recipients that we need uh, especially need like uh, our help 
and uh, we with a random uh, process that uh, is like a, a guarantee that people are chosen in a equitable way a exactly yeah. equitable way without uh, uh, having problems of corruption etc uh, we select like 10 percent of uh, of the list but like of course when we start talking with Ismatu, we wanted to go for really a big uh, result so we want 100%. To 100% another group bus <laughs> to the moon <laughs> we want and even more actually yes. if we if you're gonna help us of course the idea is like to help as many people as possible and we thought that slice was a great choice because it's very very um vulnerable group, group among other vulnerable groups mm -hmm. so it's just like um we started uh, having a lot of uh, chats and <laughs> video calls because we're all based in different cities. I'm in Barcelona, uh, someone is in Zurich, uh, his mother is in the US, Sierra Leone and many other places. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, after one year of work, we are ready to, to present you this, this campaign and hopefully you're going to help us. Yes. That was great. That Why was were you worried about being on camera? <laughs> yeah, amazing. What was the model of social income before this, before this project? Um, so I think the main thing is recurring payments because we want to create a sense of sustainability, a sense of continued hope. So um, if um, uh, our donors provide 1% of their salaries, they pledge it to social income on a recurring basis, it enables us to, over a period of time, be able to redistribute that. Mm. And our model is 100% for three years to recipients in Sierra Leone. Mm. I would also add like the... Um, the contribution arrives uh, monthly, mm -hmm. so every month we collect uh, all the money mm -hmm. and uh, one day of the month we distribute in a very easy way because everybody is receiving uh, it on their phone, directly on their phone. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go to bank, you don't need to do anything very difficult to collect the money. Like mm -hmm. it arrives in your, in your account right. and you're free to use it. How do you feel like working on this project? Working in the NGO sector as a whole. I'm super well, excited. Yeah, I am too. I think, uh, you know, I, I went to see a radio last year um, to meet some of the recipients that we work with and the team that's, uh, that's on the ground down there. And I mean, I think for me, it was just realizing how lucky I was. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a lot of things that I have in my life. I, I think I was lucky to grow up in South Africa to be born in 1985, five years before apartheid ended in South Africa. I think I was lucky to live in the Northwest and not in Soweto where kids were being shot at by police every day. So sometimes I think about my life and I think most of my life was about luck. Yes. I was lucky to be born to the parents I was at the time I was in the area that I was and I think it created a very fertile environment for me to succeed and to be safe and to be cared for and uh, to look at people in Sierra Leone who also deserve exactly the same. It's just that, unfortunately, you know, it's a completely different circumstance. And I think sometimes we have to look at ourselves and think, did I create the, the luck that I have, or am I just lucky that my life turned out this way? So I think, for me, it really fulfills me to contribute because I realize every day how lucky I am to be in this position. Oh, I feel I feel a really similar way actually because I was born in the United States. Yeah. Like I, by virtue of like speaking English is one of my native languages. Yes. By virtue of like be, even growing up like poor in the United States, um, I was still you're still like on the world stage. Yeah, I think I think about all the time you know the, the readership and the viewership is across the world. Yep. People across the world can view me in part because like once you're up on stage in the United States, you're up on stage everywhere. everywhere. There's nothing that I could think to do better than to pour into like one of my home countries. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Like what else can I? And there are so few Sierra Leoneans on the world stage. That's true. You yeah. know how for long, how much of my life I've said I'm from Sierra Leone and people said, what is that? Not even what, but like, what is that? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, but I think also like poverty is so multidimensional in Sierra Leone where, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just I don't have food, it's I don't have shelter, I don't feel safe, I don't have health care. You know, so, it's, it's so compounded, you know, and then you add slice, which is also I feel stigmatized, you know, my, my own people have a certain idea of what I am. And, mm -hmm. I mean, you might have lost your entire family. Yes. Yeah. Like for me, it feels like I'm the most privileged in the world because white men, <laughs> <laughs> Europe born. So I feel like it's absolutely needed that I do something. And that was the, the first thing that I thought, I really want to do something. And what can I do? And so just this, this idea of social income was like the 
perfect idea because it like, brings all this technology and this kind of global idea mm. because it's not just from here really it's, it's more about like thinking about our world in 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 sense of our, our whole world mm. not just one place US Europe yes. and I feel like we're, we're, we're people from all these different backgrounds but we have one clear goal one clear idea it's just like we all want the same things and yes. we want uh, a, a nice life and everybody can should have our same same chances yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's not a difficult really like sometimes mm -hmm. you think about oh what can i do to improve things it's like start doing something, something. Yeah. Yeah. that's something you said earlier that's really been sticking with me like the 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 ideation is is the hardest space to get out of the what do i do what do i do like if you take one step yes, it's down. a lot easier to figure out what you can do mm -hmm. when you're not sitting still an object in motion tends to stay in motion and all that kind of stuff yes absolutely. Yeah. And it's only, I mean, it doesn't take a long time. If you want to, you know, pledge, really, it's easy, you know, just uh, yeah, do something. Start. Exactly. Yeah. And be like, and, and you can do really, nobody is, is expecting you to do anything. That's the first thing. Oh. So if you do something, you're, really it's really yeah. a big thing. Because in this world, nobody expects you to be generous or helping you. Yeah. But like, if you do that, it, it, it also gives you something that other things don't. Don't mm. give. There's a lot of joy, I feel, in this work. Yes. Like, it's the first time that I've woken up every day and been, like, excited to get to work. We've been talking about this. And we've also been talking about, like, in the midst of global strikes and, and global solidarity, that we've never been in a better position to help each other on an international scale before. Like, the technology makes it so that you can give literally directly to somebody's home yes. across the world. Like, we've never had access to this before. So imagine if we continue to build out this infrastructure, the infrastructure that this technology gives us, how much more is possible from here on out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you don't have in, you don't have anyone in the middle because like, you know, sometimes I have a lot of friends, they are so worried about like to contributing on donation because like they think, oh, maybe this money is not going to reach, uh, reach the people yeah. or uh, uh, I don't know if this is effective. It's like... Nowadays, you, you have studies, you have literature, you have the the means to do that. It's really you just need to start doing something. Please do. Start doing something. <laughs> I don't care if it's us or someone else. Just start doing something. From us to you. Have a good day. Do Bye. something. Do something. You heard do the man. Anything. Just one thing. <laughs> I was skeptical, but this was delicious. And you could taste some chai and matcha in the same cup. Never in my life. So what an interesting Nobody marriage. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> So it's like spicy because it's like yeah. it tastes like spicy grass but in the best way but also it's two two different kinds of teas right it's green tea mm -hmm. and black, uh, tea. black tea yes who knew who knew, who knew? <laughs>